Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to uh, share some of my work with you today. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Sorry about that. So some of you may be familiar with this visualization of how uh, global temperatures have been warming over the last 150 years. So each uh, stripe is uh, showing us the average global temperature from 1850 uh, through to 2020. And we can see in the last few decades, we've had a really dramatic warming in um, global temperatures. And this has coincided with a rapid increase in the global distribution of diseases like dengue. In the 1970s, there were around nine countries around the world reporting severe outbreaks of dengue, and that number has now increased to over 120 countries. Uh, we're seeing uh, dengue and other diseases transmitted by um, Aedes mosquitoes uh, spreading into areas that were previously unaffected, and the World Health Organization estimates that around half the world's population is now at risk of these diseases. Uh, so this is uh, an example of a collaboration I've been involved in um, called the Lancet Countdown. It's a uh, global initiative which aims to track progress on health and climate change, monitoring uh, over 40 different indicators um, across several different domains, looking at um, impacts, adaptation, mitigation and co-benefits, economics and finance. Back to et les bénéfices dans plusieurs secteurs économiques, politiques, etc. Um, so we can see this time series plot is showing how uh, the climatic suitability for malaria in highland areas has increased since the 1950s uh, by nearly 40%, particularly in the African highlands, um, which are areas which have a low human development index. And on the map, we can show areas um, in red where we are seeing an expansion of the length in the transmission season. Um, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine last year, we published a, a modeling study where we were projecting uh, changes in the length of the transmission season and the population at risk of the two major vector-borne diseases, malaria and dengue. And we found that if temperature, temperatures are to continue increasing along a business as usual trajectory uh, with warming up to 3.7 degrees C, then we would uh, see an additional 4.7 billion people at risk of these diseases. Whereas if we were able to uh, take uh, uh, concerted action, uh, meet the Paris agreements and keep temperatures below one degree, that uh, increase in population at risk would be halved to around 2.4 billion people. Sorry, now, Rachel, Rachel, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm being asked by the interpreters to maybe speak uh, a little bit more slowly. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, so this uh, increasing risk of mosquito-borne diseases is not only due to climate change, it's also due to things like rapid urbanization uh, and inadequate uh, infrastructure. We can see here, this is a photo of one of the largest favelas in the city of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And we can see here lots of blue patches on the screen. And these are uh, temporary water storage containers, which are relied upon during uh, water shortages and uh, during drought events. And these kind of uh, containers also serve as ideal breeding uh, sites for the Aedes um, aegypti mosquito, which is the main vector transmitting uh, dengue in uh, Latin America. So we're seeing a combination of international travel and trade, which is allowing both um, humans and the mosquitoes to spread uh, these diseases to new um, areas. The climate crisis where we're seeing dramatically uh, warming temperatures across the globe, which is allowing um, mosquitoes to establish themselves and then transmit diseases as they're introduced and also an increase in, in the frequency and intensity of extreme climatic events uh, due to climate change, which also changes the timing and intensity of um, certain mosquito, mosquito and other climate sensitive diseases. 
So this is an example of some work done by Isabel Fletcher, who recently completed her PhD in my group, um, where we were looking at uh, changes in the risk of uh, reintroduction of malaria in an area which had experienced um, some intensive interventions um, up to the point of near elimination, but there was um, there is an increasing risk of reemergence of malaria, and uh, we found that climate was an important driver of um, falciparum malaria uh, compared to vivax, partly due to um, more complex issues to do with relapses uh, with vivax malaria. Uh, so we found that temperature explained nearly all the seasonality in um, in falciparum malaria. And we also found that the temperature limits for falciparum have been increasing in um, southern coastal Ecuador, where we were studying the impact of climate and interventions on malaria. So this is uh, a warning sign that those areas that may be near elimination or reaching elimination, uh, the environmental conditions are becoming much more suitable. And we're seeing other pressures such as uh, migration uh, from other areas experiencing economic crises. So it's really important to be considering both the environmental and, and socio-political situations um, before abandoning efforts uh, to eliminate um, diseases like malaria. Uh, this is an example of a um, scoping review which was recently published by Tilly Alcania, who's a PhD student in my group, um, and here we were looking at evidence uh, linking uh, infectious disease outbreaks to extreme climatic events um, such as cyclones, droughts and flooding and assessing um, the uh, evidence and the agreement of the impact of things like uh, drought and deng on dengue or uh, flooding on cholera, for example. And this is an example of some work by Sophie Lee, a PhD student in my group, who has been looking at the role of climate connectivity and um, urbanization on the expansion of dengue in Brazil. So we've seen that dengue is starting to spread to areas that were previously um, protected due to geographical barriers, uh, such as temperature barriers or remote locations. But thanks to the warming climate, particularly in the south of Brazil, and also the increased connectivity and more transport links to uh, remote areas such as the Amazon rainforest, we're starting to see um, outbreaks of dengue occurring in these uh, previously unaffected areas. Mm -hmm. So this is a, um, a piece that we published a couple of years ago in the BMJ, where we uh, made some recommendations of strategies that should be taken to strengthen the global response um, to climate change and infectious disease threats. So these included um, recognizing the problem with a transdisciplinary lens, uh, so considering one health um, aspects, uh, looking at the environment, animal and human health uh, all together. Um, also leading by example in ensuring that the health sector is also uh, mitigating emissions um, and adopting um, environmentally friendly practices and also improving their own resilience to extreme events. Um, increasing funding for climate and health, we're starting to see some positive movements in that direction, particularly from um, the Wellcome Trust. And uh, improving uh, the use of um, data and analytics to build uh, strong decision support systems, including training, uh, infrastructural uh, investments, and increasing the use of environmental information in early warning systems. So the idea of a lot of our research is to collect uh, this uh, disparate multi-source data sets, including earth observations and climate information, combining this with disease case data, and surveillance data, and in collaboration with our stakeholders through a co-creation process, designing um, decision support systems that can help build resilience to climate change. So thinking about how we can translate this global information from satellites um, and other sources and really make sure it can be usable at the local level. So this is an example of a, uh, a project we've been working on, uh, funded by the UK Space Agency to develop a dengue early warning system. Um, for uh, the Ministry of Health in, in Vietnam. 
Um, and so this article uh, highlights the, the model framework that we put together to incorporate seasonal climate uh, forecasts in a dengue prediction model and to provide um, probabilistic forecasts from one to six months ahead. So this model um, combines um, earth observations, um, a hydrological model and uh, with surveillance data on dengue cases over a 19 year period and combines all this into a uh, model super ensemble. So this is where we formulate several models and, and select the best set of models. So you're allowing uh, models that take different uh, drivers to help predict the uh, distribution of possible outcomes. And then we combine this with um, a seasonal climate forecast, uh, an ensemble of forecasts to allow us to incorporate the uncertainty in our predictors and to give us this dengue forecast up to six months ahead of time. And we've been working with uh, uh, local partners to develop this um, interface uh, where the users are able to enter into the system um, and check the forecast every month. And this is displayed as um, maps to show uh, the probability of exceeding predefined thresholds, as well as time series, which uh, predict the probability of um, dengue outbreaks several months in advance, depending on the, the local thresholds of interest. Um, and this is an example of a body of work we've been uh, put together with partners in, in the Caribbean, looking at uh, modeling the impacts of climate on, on dengue, on our co-development um, stakeholder needs and perceptions assessments that we've done with stakeholders in the region from um, uh, CAFA, PAHO, down to uh, local country ministries of health, um, and also uh, some policy papers that we've published uh, with partners at the World Meteorological Organization. So in this work, uh, we um, found some interesting patterns where um, drought events followed by exceptionally wet conditions seem to provide um, the optimum conditions for um, dengue outbreaks uh, combined with uh, particularly warm conditions several months um, ahead of time. And so we've been working um, with partners at the Red Cross and in Barbados to try and uh, develop an impact-based forecasting uh, framework where we're combining interactions between long and short uh, lag climate indicators to try and um, predict the most likely scenario for the risk of dengue several months in advance. So according to our model, if, if we have hot and dry conditions followed by um, a particularly wet season, this would um, lead to a forecast of a particularly um, high uh, risk of dengue. Whereas if we had cool and dry conditions and um, this continued to be dry into the next season, then we would have a lower risk of dengue. And this work has been um, mentioned and incorporated in the Caribbean Health Climatic Bulletin uh, following a, a drought event that was observed in 2020, uh, followed by a forecast of um, exceptionally wet conditions in the Eastern Caribbean. So this led to um, a, a warning for uh, dengue control teams to be uh, particularly aware of controlling any potential breeding sites that may arise from uh, mitigating the impacts of drought through water storage. And in terms of implementation, um, there are several challenges, um, particularly how we translate these probabilistic forecasts into some uh, risk framework. Uh, so we've been uh, looking at the other climate services that are provided by the uh, meteorological services in Barbados, uh, where they predict, for example, um, dust haze and other uh, climate sensitive outcomes. And uh, this tends to be accompanied by um, this impact matrix where you combine your confidence in your uh, forecast or warning with the uh, severity of the impact to uh, then provide some sort of uh, advice to stakeholders, which may be range from no action to be aware, be prepared and, and take action. So this is something that we're currently working on. And the other big implementation challenge is the um, lack of technical capacity and financial resources to really build sustainable systems. Um, so through a study um, led by Anna um, stewart um, we found that there was particularly um, uh, a lack of skills in certain um, 
uh, processing of um, environmental GIS and climate data, and of course in financial resources to be able to uh, employ experts to work between uh, the health and climate sectors. So last year we um, developed a, a, a training course for our partners in the Caribbean on um, an impact-based forecasting methodology for predicting arboviral disease risk in small island developing states. Um, so that was a really uh, nice experience for us to be able to showcase the work we've done and go through it step by step and be able to interact um, with the users to understand the kind of the, the sticking points or the, the, the areas which uh, we could improve and, and to make it more uh, user friendly. Uh, we've also been uh, working on uh, trying to develop dengue early warning systems for Brazil um, over several years. Um, so we started by uh, producing a forecast ahead of the uh, 2014 uh, World Cup, where we were combining uh, seasonal climate forecasts with um, the dengue cases available at the time of forecast to produce this probabilistic uh, map to show the risk of, of dengue six months, uh, three, three months ahead of time. So this is one of the first demonstrations of actually making a dengue forecast in real time. And this is a very valuable uh, learning exercise for us uh, to continue our other work in Vietnam and, and also in the Caribbean. Um, this here is the evaluation of the forecast after the event using the um, observed cases so we could see uh, what was the probability um, of observing the correct cat um, category in each um, in each microregion in Brazil and for each uh, warning level? And this helped us detect areas where the model works uh, better than in other areas. And we've been recently extending this work to incorporate um, delayed and nonlinear impacts of hydrometeorological extremes. And we found a very similar pattern as we did in Barbados, where um, long lag uh, drought and uh, short lag, extremely wet conditions increase the risk of, of dengue. And we found that this drought effect was particularly exacerbated in urban areas, uh, which experience uh, more water shortages. So this has um, been interesting for thinking about how we may um, vary our um, decision frameworks depending on the uh, landscape. So in urban areas, there may be more emphasis on monitoring droughts in advance of the dengue season, whereas in rural areas, there may be more emphasis on, on uh, monitoring extremely wet conditions. And we've recently been awarded a project from the Wellcome Trust called Harmonize, which looks at harmonizing multi-scale spatiotemporal data for health and climate change hotspots. And the goal of this project is to bring together satellite images, gridded climate reanalysis and forecasts, to combine this with uh, ground truth data, uh, which we will collect using drones and weather stations, uh, which are strategically deployed in areas where we're lacking ground truth data, and uh, to combine this with socio, um, with socio and demographic and health system indicators. Um, uh, one second. Sorry. And we will be doing this for um, cities, small island talk, uh, small islands, Amazon rainforest, and in highland areas with partners in Latin America and the Caribbean. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lowe, for your it's a comprehensive presentation, and it's great to have access to all of this of this research. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I want to encourage again the participants or even even the panelists, uh, if they have any questions at this stage uh, about your presentation on the global environmental change and infectious disease outbreaks. Um, I guess now is, is, is a great opportunity. <laughs> uh, at the moment, I don't see anything in the Q&A um, section or in the chat. So I'll just uh, leave maybe uh, a little, just a couple of seconds more the opportunity to, to ask some questions. Um, otherwise, what we can do is also go directly to the third and last, uh, I see one question third and last presentation. Um, we have a question from the panel, from the participants. Uh, hello, uh, would it be possible to implement early warning systems for other vector-borne diseases? Question. 
Um, yeah, it really depends on the data that you have available to be able to formulate um, an early warning system. Uh, so the kind of models we use to, to develop these model frameworks that feed into an early warning system, um, they rely on uh, sort of historical records of um, disease cases to help us establish these relationships between climatic drivers and socioeconomic factors and the disease itself. So for any um, health outcome where you have sufficient data over uh, long periods of time and a sufficient spatial resolution, then it's possible to apply the kind of frameworks we've been developing. Thank you. Um, just again, looking if there's any other question, I see uh, our next speaker already has a, a video on. Um, I see that, is it? Thank you, you're getting, thank you for your answer, uh, Rachel. Okay, great. So uh, I, I see a lot of commonalities also, no, between the messages that, that you were giving um, through your presentation uh, with also with a presentation from Dr. Ortmans. Um, what would you, for you be, uh, Rachel, like the main takeaways that you would like to give our participants, like the top, top three, maybe I'm putting you on the spot here, but. Um, sort of take home messages for developing these kind of, I, I, I think the, the key, the key is really uh, that sort of co-creation, co-development stage. So there's no point trying to develop a model without uh, really speaking to uh, the people who, who are going to use the model, making sure it's sort of problem-based, um, user-driven research. Uh, that's probably one of the most important things. It's also very challenging to develop this sort of thing in uh, resource or data scarce settings. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that, that can be challenging. Um, we do... Uh, we develop our early warning system work and we also look at um, indicators of climate sensitive diseases which sometimes can help you understand uh, be able to track changes in in um, suitability for example um, in the past um, and present and future so perhaps trying to combine different approaches depending on uh, the data you have available to you and and the uh, stakeholders that you're you're working with Thank you. <laughs> you. You have another question from uh, Oscar uh, saying, thanks a lot for your excellent presentation, Dr. Lowe. I would like to ask if the early warning system and model using satellites produced good predictions beyond 2016. Thanks, yeah. Um, we, we didn't test that particular model uh, beyond 2016, but then our, uh, our follow-up work looking at the hydrometeorological extremes, mm -hmm. Um, seem to perform uh, quite well, particularly for picking up, for example, the outbreak in, in 2019. Um, it did, after 2016, things became more challenging in Latin America and the Caribbean due to the introduction of uh, Zika and, and dengue, sorry, uh, Zika and chikungunya, uh, which meant that a lot of the um, suspected surveillance data was not uh, necessarily reliable. So that's definitely been a, a challenge for for prediction um, in the region since around 2015. Um, but yeah, in, in general, the model seems to do um, a reasonably good job at picking up those uh, big epidemics. Thank you very much, Dr. Lowe. Professor, sorry. Um, thank you for your answer. Uh, I, I think I don't see any other questions at this, this point. So again, maybe if you can stay, if you have time to stay, perhaps more questions will come at the end. Um, so thank you again.